Hey guys, welcome to WordCamp's Crafting Magical Creatures and Beasts class slash workshop. Um, today we're going to look at a, 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 a big, making kind of like a big list of creatures that we know and are familiar with and are going to find different ways to modify or change them and come up with our own versions of these creatures and just sort of look at general rules and guidelines for creating fantastical characters like this. So we're in a stage channel on Discord. If you're watching on one of our other sites like YouTube, Twitch, or Twitter, you should come join us on Discord so you can join our stage channel and request to speak by clicking the hand raise icon. Um, you have to then click the accept button if I invite you to the stage. So WordCamp is part of SkillCamp, which includes many other servers like ScriptCamp, which is our biggest server focused on screenwriting. We are committed to taking your idea all the way to completed draft in our many programs, like we have a boot camps and classes, and we also have lots of one-off events just like this free classes, table reads, script swaps, and writer's groups. We have some classes for our supporting members too, which would include things like boot camps and labs. Um, so here's just a little about me. I won't go way too into this, but I am a screenwriter, mostly focused on horror, thriller, and action movies. But in the, uh, in the rest of the time, I'm a novelist who mostly writes fantasy. So fantasy, horror, and sci-fi. In the novel world, I teach the boot camps in the weekly writer's lab. So here's all the upcoming stuff that will be on Script Camp and WordCamp. We have today at 5, World Building Science Fiction. So if you are into fantasy, chances are you might like sci-fi as well. So come by there for um, some interesting brainstorming on sci-fi worlds. Coming up with sci-fi premises. Friday, June 30th at 6, we have that overview class of our new session of the feature boot camp, which is taking you from idea to finish draft of a brand new feature in eight weeks. So that first class will give you some early feedback and tell you what to expect in the upcoming boot camp and give you some guidance on your ideas, even if they're at the early stages. And then the week one of feature boot camp starts July 7th, and that's going to be running Fridays from 6 to 8 p.m. for eight weeks. We then have the first class of our TV pilot in six weeks program starting July 9th. That's going to be running Sundays 10 to noon, and we have a new session of novel boot camp. That's going to be uh, Saturdays 12 to 2 starting July 22nd. Also, upcoming uh, uh, QA session, AMA session, Ask Me Anything on the Writer's Strike with uh, WGA member Max Perry, who is going to be answering all your questions Saturday, July 15th from 12 to 2. Okay, um, so here's the, just a recap of those dates if you wanted to see those. Again, pilot, Sundays 10 to noon. Novels, Saturdays 12 to 2. Features, Fridays 6 to 8. These are all in Pacific time. Okay, so this isn't the exact outline that I'm going to use, but we'll use something like this. We're going to start with just a big old list of creatures. Um, we're going to sort of look at some different factors like their biology, physiology, um, personality, behavior, society, and culture. We're sort of assembling our own little monster manual here for those familiar with the Dungeons and Dragons kind of books. We're kind of making a list of creatures, and then we're going to start to sort of play around with them like an alchemist. So we're going to think of different ways that they can fit into stories, both as protagonist or antagonist, and um, just kind of play around with different ideas and conceptions of how these creatures could work, changing things about them like biology, habitat, society, culture, diet, reproduction, behavior, all these things, and try to think of new stories that could result from those modified creatures. Okay, so I think where I want to start is quickly breaking down the difference between folklore and mythology, and then we're going to start by just making a big list. So we're just going to call out uh, whatever creatures you want. We're going to try to assemble as big a list as possible. I'll give you guys in, in as big a list as we can in like five to ten minutes. I'm going to give you just some guidelines to begin with, though. So folklore refers to traditional beliefs, customs, and stories of a community or culture. It often will include legends, folktales, and proverbs and things like this that are passed down orally from generation to generation. So folklore creatures are going to be things like ghosts. I mean, that's one of the most common folklore characters seen in every single culture, though they're not the same version exactly. Ghosts are going to be a really universal folklore concept. Um, so we can write that down in our sort of pre-Tolkien category. And then we have mythology, which is often going to involve gods, goddesses, and their descendants or creations. And these stories are often written down in religious texts or literature and are considered more in, uh, at least at one point, were considered true by some people as in a religious context. So mythology might involve characters like, you know, Hercules is a mythological character. And we can say things like the Minotaur is uh, factored into the mythology category too because he's 
introduced in a myth um, and is part of the larger sort of story. He's like the, I forget exactly what the Minotaur's backstory is, but I think he's like the, the misbegotten child of a god or goddess, right? So um, in any case, we can see that that is linked directly to the gods of that specific pantheon. So to that end, we have to consider that mythology. Okay, so we're going to separate our creatures into just the basic categories of pre-Tolkien, which is going to include all this kind of antediluvian, biblical, mythological, and folklore characters like Ghost and Cyclops. Then we have Tolkien, which is going to... They're not all original characters to Tolkien, but Tolkien kind of acts as this pinch point in the hourglass of fantasy, as some have said in the past, meaning that um, everything... Uh, he sort of gathered everything that existed, and everything after Tolkien is sort of shaped by his vision of how these things can all fit together. Because we had stories about elves and stories about dwarves, and stories about, you know, um, small people that live in the forest and things, and, and goblins and things like this. But he kind of combined everything into a coherent world that felt like all those characters had their own physiology, their own habitats, their own ways that they interacted with each other, their own really clear personalities. And he kind of defined how we thought about a lot of those characters moving forward. I mean, before Tolkien, elves were like little Christmas dudes. They're more like gnomes, right? He kind of considered this version of elves that was... I mean, uh, he's cobbling together sources largely from sort of Norse-inspired epics and things like this, and, um, you know, things uh, things like Beowulf. Um, but his version of elves, and there's a couple of different types of Tolkien elves, but we will look at sort of just high elves, which are called Kalaquendi in Tolkien uh, language. Um, and these would be the sort of uh, the elves that we only ever see standing on balconies staring out into the wilderness but they have kind of a very refined sense of culture. We never really see them lift a finger. We They're very sort of standoffish, cold, and refined high society elves. And that's kind of like the Tolkien version of them. And then, we, of course, we see other versions of elves too, like Santa elves, right? We could probably put Santa elves in the pre-Tolkien category. And that would be more based on the kind of Germanic and Scandinavian conceptions of what elves are, which are little tiny people that are sometimes invisible, um, which are called uh, Heinzelmenschen in German, I believe. The, the little, essentially small fairies, or uh, this would be elves as more of like a fairy or a spirit. So that's kind of the pre-Tolkien conception. So we can double up a little bit and have multiple different versions of some of these characters as they've been defined by specific authors or specific creators. You can include creatures from specific books or things like that if you want, but if there is a more genericized version of what that character is, then you could just include that instead. Like, for instance, we could put White Walkers under the post-Tolkien category uh, from George R. R. Martin, but that's kind of the same as a, uh, or it's similar at least to what we call a white, W-I-G-H-T, in pre-Tolkien talk. So you don't really have to uh, be too careful with that. But in any case, um, uh, let's let's get ready to flesh out our big list. So um, you can include creatures that are derived from human spirits or human connections, such as vampires or werewolves or, or spirits or things like that. But you don't have to. This could also include things like you know, the owl bear or whatever, which is a DD and d invention. I'll just put the owl bear on our post-Tolkien section. That's going to be just a brand new monster that was made up for fiction. Um, and uh, you can include the author of reference if it's some random thing that you don't think anyone will have heard of <laughs> if you really want to. Um, okay, so here's our three categories, pre-Tolkien, Tolkien, and post-Tolkien. Let's just use the chat and give us a big list of everything you guys can think of. Just don't even be careful at all. Just just fill it out, and I'll start typing stuff into the chat. Okay, um, and Jacko Pantern has told us, the Minotaur was the child of the Queen of Crete and a bull. Okay, so not actually a god or goddess, but a, uh, a queen of the island of Crete. Okay, so let's start filling stuff out. All right, we have leprechauns. That's going to be pre-Tolkien. Uh, Jack O. Pantern tells us dwarves. Yep, so we've got sort of different versions of that. I'm going to put dwarves just under Tolkien because I think most people are familiar with that type of dwarves. Um, what else? Uh, let's get more. We have ground dragons. I'm not sure what that's from, but um, maybe we'll just put... I'll just put dragon on the list here, and then I think that kind of fits into all of these because there are versions of dragon that we have seen before and after Tolkien, kind of influenced and changed by him, of course. We have one from Vichiquita, Will-O-Wisp. Yeah, Will-O-The-Wisp. Sort of creepy guiding lights in swamps. Harpy, Mind Flare, Wyvern. All right, great. So some of these fit into different categories with Harpy, Wyvern. That's going to go pre-Tolkien, but post-Tolkien is going to be Mind Flare because that is a D&D-specific creature. 
Medusa, Centaur, Bugbear, and Ankeg. Bugbear does have a sort of pre-Tolkien definition to it, though. This is also kind of like a figure of speech, a Bugbear meaning, being like kind of a rhetorical uh, like construction in a way. But it also is a type of creature. And then we have, uh, what was it? Ankeg, which I believe is from D&D as well. A-N-K-H-E-G. I could have that wrong if that actually has roots in some folklore. Uh, we have drakes, wyverns. Yep, yeah, so I'm just going to kind of put all the dragon adjacent stuff. Dragon slash drake slash wyvern on the same line. Uh, let's see, what else we got? Changeling and puka. Yep, puka spelled differently in a lot of different versions. I think it's sort of like that sometimes, um, but we have seen different versions of that. Especially, there was a movie on Hulu that spelled it with an H at the end, kind of like you have here. Uh, giant spider. Sure. Golems. Animated building with legs. I love that. That's like, yeah, so animated building. This is like the chicken legs on Baba Yaga's hut. I'm not sure how common that one is, but that's cool. Godling or demigod. Yeah, sure. We can put demigod on here. Sometimes they look like people and act like people, and sometimes they resemble other things. We have griffins. Yes. Sometimes spelled with a PH in the usually the UK spelling. I'm going to use that. What else we got? Feathered snakes, trolls. Feathered snake. Oops. Troll. Yep, troll having... I'm going to put troll under Tolkien as well, just because that's a very specific version of what trolls are like. And then I think if we look at post-Tolkien trolls, we're looking at the little dolls with colorful hair, right? <laughs> uh, what else? Kelpie. Trolls and Ents. Yep, so Kelpie mythological. Ents, um, I believe there was probably some earlier than Tolkien version of, but I'm not really familiar with it, um, so I'm going to put it under Tolkien. I think the earlier versions of Ents might have been called things like, what are they called in D&D and Pathfinder? Not Dryads, but Treants. I think that may have been the, like T-R-E-A-N-T, which kind of sounds like Ent, and maybe the word Ent comes from that. I'm not actually sure. Demons and SCP monsters. Great. Okay, so yeah, we'll put SCP monsters under post Tolkien. That's kind of like internet folklore characters. And then we have demons would be, yes, far pre-Tolkien. That's biblical, biblical creatures and characters, which are sometimes considered antediluvian. Mimics from Nacho. Yep, Nacho, mimics are specifically from D&D, but there are other creatures that have resembled that in other stories. I think Mimics originated in D&D, at least. Angels. Yep, we have demons, so let's put angels on there. I'll just put that on the same category. And then these are sometimes categorized as celestials in kind of like D&D speak. Demons slash angels. All right, this is looking like a pretty good list. I think we've got a bunch more just in Tolkien alone that we can include. Nobody has mentioned Halfling, Hobbit. Uh, somebody did say orcs with a K. And there were sort of orcs before, but I'm going to leave it under Tolkien because I think his version is the one, the kind of definitive version of what the orc is in a lot of ways. The post-Tolkien orc is a little bit different. The, the Tolkien orcs are a little bit more kind of bit like centered on this fear of industrialization and invasion. So they're kind of like World War I Germans in some ways. And you can see that influence, obviously, because Tolkien fought in World War I. They're um, kind of servile, and they sort of act in big armies, and uh, they're kind of like ferocious man-eating creatures. Whereas post-Tolkien orcs in the kind of like, um, w there's some different traditions for them. In some versions, they are a little bit like noble savages is how they're portrayed. Sometimes they're portrayed more militaristically, which in D&D split them between orcs and hobgoblins, which kind of took on the fascist tendencies of orcs and split the kind of animalistic tendencies into the, the a subspecies. And then we have yeah the 40k orcs which are the kind of really crazy I'm gonna I'm gonna put 40k orc on here just because that's such a great creature. Um, but these are the sort of very barbarian style orcs but that have a touch of psychic powers to them and they through their kind of idiocy almost powers their creations in a way which is kind of a cool way that their magic system works. We have Chupacabra uh, for, yeah, cryptid or 
pretty talking creature. Chupa Cabra. At least I think that that's an older legend. Do we consider demons fallen angels? Um, I think that Lucifer is a fallen angel, but I think he may, in some accounts, and I'm not sure what the actual mainline canon is, but that he created other demons. So I think the original Satan is an angel, but his his off his offspring or minions are not necessarily. I could have that wrong. Uh, Dan asks, is a halfling considered a monster? Well, maybe not, but we're not just writing down monsters. We're writing down all creatures that we can think of. Uh, let's see. Anything else? Mothman. Great. That's a cryptid. I think Mothman might have fr had original sightings in the 1800s. I could have that wrong, so I'm going to put him up here. But if I'm wrong on that and he's more of a 20th century creation, then we'd put him under the post Tolkien kind of cryptid category. Uh, gnomes. Thank you, Dan. Gnomes. That's a good one. Gnomes have a bunch of different sort of conceptions of what they're like. Um, the sort of post-Tolkien gnome, I'm going to list as separate. So I'm going to say like Tech Gnome. <laughs> that sounds like a cool book right there, doesn't it? Tech Gnome. Uh, and so the Tech Gnome is kind of like the Warcraft version of gnomes where we have kind of divided because we have so many little characters. We have dwarves, halflings um, in some versions of elves, and then we have gnomes pixies brownies all these things so in some later kind of fantasy media we have decided that gnomes are inventors and they use their little gears and pulleys and stuff to make little flying helicopters and things like that so that's like the sort of warcraft version and 40k orc would be uh barbarians future barbarians slash psychics inadvertent psychics it's kind of a fun idea all right what else um pincoya like a chilean mermaid type creature i've not heard of that but i'll put it up there in the folklore section pincoya or maybe i can just say mermaid psychic humans okay psychic people i'm we might not really be able to consider a separate creature but a lot of these uh, a lot of these monsters actually do have psychic abilities of their own um, or some kind of magic that they have access to and some of them even have a whole magic system that sort of governs how the character works like I don't think anyone's really mentioned vampires or werewolves but they both definitely have complex magic systems that dif differ depending on the work that we're in and every author has to kind of like define that character's rules very carefully um, and there's a really long really good wiki, uh, TV tropes article not wiki article TV tropes on different variations of different creatures so for instance it's called our creatures are different so you can find a section on our vampires are different and see all the different sort of variations on how many different ki kinds of vampires work right we have everything from your sewer dwelling creeps like the nosferatu who look like monsters and who kind of act like predators as sort of like seen in the movie 30 days of night then we have the sort of very refined very calculating very high class noble vampire we have the goofy Count Chocula type vampire. I mean, there's so many different versions of these guys and how they work that there's whole articles just listing all the different types of vampires. Look at this. Uh, feral vampires, classic Chinese vampires, uh, Dampier, technically living vampires, technological vampires, vampires created by disease. We've got all kinds of stuff. So this is a great article. I'll link it in the chat. Our monsters are different is what it's called. All right, we have a couple more suggestions of creatures that I'll include these, and then we can stop listing them for now. Um, let's look at, oh, Zach is saying, what am I defining as inadvertent psychic? I'm referring to the 40K orcs specifically, which are sort of like barbarian savages that don't realize that they are psychic. So it's like they paint their vehicles red because they think it makes them go faster. And what they don't realize is that it actually does. It like magically makes the vehicle go faster because they painted it red and because they believe that it will. So it's kind of like they're a race of creatures that don't know that they're psychic. <laughs> um, mutants. Maybe a mutant could be a magical creature. I think most of the time we say mutant, though, we're referring to something created by technology. We might be able to say kind of like a flesh golem would be a sort of uh, like um, magical version of that. So I'll just put the different subcategories of golem. We have everything from stone, clay, flesh, wood, just an inanimate object or an inanimate substance that has been carved into the shape of a person and that acts as a servant to whoever created it. All right, what else we got? Sirens. 
Uh, we have Lich from Dan. Thank you, Lich. Selkies, Shapeshifters, and Borrowers. I think Borrowers is the name of a book that's about these little guys. They're usually called Brownies, I believe. Um, or some kind of house spirit. I'm not exactly sure. It's a different cultures have different names for these little tiny people that do chores or make mischief around your home shapeshifters yeah various types of shapeshifters that we've seen um anything else i've missed did i do nymphs asks amanda no i didn't do nymphs yet good one nymphs there's all kinds of fey that we haven't gotten to and then uh let's see kikimura strigia Polednesy and Domovoy. I think these are sort of just cultural specific um, folklore creatures. These sound like Russian to me. I'm not 100% sure if all of them are. I know the Domovoy is. Alright, so let's stop here for now. I think we have plenty of things to choose from. I might fill out a couple other things under the Tolkien category just, because, just to see if we've missed anything. We have elves, dwarves, hobbits, Orcs, trolls, ants. Do we miss any big ones? No, I think we actually got them, though. I, If we are going to just talk Tolkien-specific, then I will include things like um, Maiar, which are basically just demigods slash angels. Okay. So let's... Um, oh, I, I see a couple more in the chat that I just want to make sure to add. And then I'm not adding any more for now. So we're going to put a pause on that. But maybe we can continue to update this as the class goes on. So there are, um, Rainbow has told us all the ones that we mentioned a minute ago. Kikimura, Domovoy, were Slavic. Thank you for that. Yeah, we have Dragon. Um, I think we have Dragon down already. Dragon. Yeah, we have a couple different variations of dragons like the Wyverns and Drakes. Elementals. I would say it does not quite fall under Golem. I'm going to put it under post-Tolkien, though, just because um, I think there have been elemental spirits in many different folklores and mythologies, but um, in the kind of fantasy D&D type world, we've defined elemental a little more carefully as almost like a creature or monster or person made out of that element. And we just saw a Pixar movie entirely based on this, didn't we? Okay, and then, yeah, we have ghosts already. Cool. All right, we're pausing the creature list for now. Um, once I include these last couple that Trollkeeper <laughs> included that I wanted to paste in. So the last ones will be fairies, pixies, unicorns, and phoenix. Great. So we'll, we'll include fairies, unicorn, phoenix. All right. So here's our list for now. We've got a bunch to choose from, mostly from the pre-Tolkien kind of era but all the way down through Tolkien, through post-Tolkien. And there's plenty more that I'm sure that we can add. We can do this all day. Um, but let's do a little deeper digging on a few of them. Let's flesh three of them out. Let's pick a couple of our favorites. Um, and we're going to write out a little manual entry for them. So physical characteristics, habitat, society and culture, rules or magic system, and then personality. And then we're going to play around with those and see if we can come up with some new versions of them. Dan says nobody mentioned any Final Fantasy creatures, do we? I guess not. It's not that means I have to add Chocobo onto the <laughs> list here. Ch ch how is Chocobo? Is that right? Chocobo? Oh, it's with a C, not a K. Okay, um, so can we get a volunteer who wants to help us flesh out some creatures a little more? Any hands raised for this one? Pokemon, that's a good one, too. There's a lot of different Pokemon to choose from. All right. Hi, Rainbow Eden. Hello, uh, Eden. Sorry, I keep changing to Rainbow for Pride Month. Okay, great. So let's start by choosing a creature from the list that we've listed out. Uh, yeah, uh... So I have mentioned a few Slavic ones because uh, they're near and dear to my heart. So uh, uh, apparently from the way you reacted to them, you don't know a lot of them. So if you have like a, a favorite from one of those, I particularly like Polednice. She is amazing. Okay, I don't know what that and, is. Uh, 
uh, Kikimura so is actually a variation on a Slavic vampire. Okay. So which one do you want to go with? Probably Polednice. Okay. So we'll have to fill that one out because I'm not sure what that is. So let's start with... There we go, Polednice. Let's start with physical characteristics. So what does it look like? Size, shape, weight, color, things like that. It takes the shape of a woman. Okay. And she usually appears during midday. Oh, because okay, so Polednice means midday. This is magic system now, so it appears during midday. Is this a type of ghost? It is a specter okay. type of thing. She has physical form, but uh, she, she's usually depicted with a sickle. She uh, appears in fields. Okay. And uh, she has a hinged mouth. Hinged mouth. A woman with a hinged mouth. So she can open it really big? Yes. All right. And the thing is, uh, she will uh, target unruly children. Okay. So personality targets unruly children. Target meaning what? Like kills them or eats them or does what? Yes. Which one? She, she will come for them and uh, presumably eat them. There is one famous poem about it, and it is a dark... It is a mother that is scolding her child, and she says, if you don't stop screaming, the Polednice will take you. And the child doesn't stop screaming. The child is around, like, three years old in this poem. And on midday, the specter actually does come and enters the house, and as the mother is trying to cradle her child in her arms to, to like, protect it from this, absolute like un uh, unhinged thing that is in front of her she's she's like she has this sickle she she's dressed in rags and she's showing like parts of bone she looks more like a zombie than a person really and suddenly the specter just turns around and leaves and relieved the mother releases the child and realizes she choked it oh wow what a twist Okay, so we got um, a zombie-like woman with an un unhinged mouth appears at midday in fields, so sort of seems associated with agriculture to me. I mean, if you appear in a field with yes. a sickle, that seems to me that it's like a peasant spirit of some kind, or maybe a farmer, or related to the And harvest. also, if you, if you are familiar with, uh, what is that, uh, American gods, mm -hmm. there was Palunochnaya uh, Siozda, um... Ranaya Siozda and uh, the free spirits that lived with the guy with the hammer forgot his name. They they were free women. They were her sisters. They're her sisters. Oh, for okay. some godforsaken this... reason, she wasn't featured, and I am going to die salty about that. So, is this one specific character, or is this like a type of ghost? Would you say? No, 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 no. It is a specific character. She is the midday star, or the midday lady. Uh, uh -huh. Then there is the midnight lady, the dusk lady, and the dawn lady. There's four of them. Okay, okay. So this is one specific per um, entity. This is not just like a, a class of entity. Yes. Okay. Um, so in that case, we'll just say she is a woman with a hinged mouth, zombie appearance, Appears with a sickle in the fields. A society and culture in this case doesn't quite seem applicable unless we can ask what the backstory of this character is. Do you know any of that? No, not okay. really. I, I, I think I think they were four sisters cursed to be appearing at the four times main times of day. Okay. And what culture does this come from? Slavic. Okay. Mainly a Russian, but but a lot of uh, Czech fairy tales center around that as well. See, see, there. All right. And then, so what do we know about the magic system or rule set associated with the character? So she appears at midday. She is maybe drawn yes, to misbehaving it, children. And if you call on her, she will appear. If you say her name. Oh, if you say her name. 
even if it's not midday? She will come at midday, but if you say her name, you have called upon her, and she's a... Uh... Okay, so she'll come during the following... During the next midday, I guess, is when she will show up. And... Yes, the upcoming midday. Okay. And in the poem that I mentioned, the whole uh, kerfuffle about stop screaming happened in the morning, and uh, she came basically where when the mother and the child were having lunch. Okay, great. So, um, we have a little entry for this character here. We have um, how she appear, how and when she appears, how we can summon this ghost, the type of things that she does. As far as we know, she shows up to punish children and eat them, or at least is used by people to punish their children and to scare them into behaving. Um, let's change one thing about the character. So pick one of these categories, physical, habitat, society and culture, magic system or rules or personality. And let's um, see what we can come up with. So maybe change it to the opposite of what it was before. So maybe you'd say instead of eating children, she I only don't eats feel like people. she has a personality. Okay. Her personality is murder. Okay, so let's change it. What do you think her what's something her personality could be like that's not murderous? Hmm. She she is a field spirit. So so she maybe she maybe use her sickle to do the field work during midday because okay. that's the hottest time of the day so so the people would be cooped up in in uh, like um in their house and she would leave uh, the crops uh for and to associate it with children if the family is hungry and they're struggling she would specifically target that that's good. Okay, so this is like the, just it's like the opposite. Do the field work during the midday for them so yeah. they can take care of the children. Sure. So maybe she's drawn to struggling farm families or strugg struggling farmers. She's a helpful ghost. And what would she do I, with the I, unhinged I'm seeing draw? like. A... Protect. Maybe protect okay maybe she could fight off bad spirits with it maybe she could eat the bad spirits like pac-man or maybe she can unhinge she, her jaw she could and absolutely pac-man the... people yes yeah i was thinking it'd be kind of cool if if she's a helpful farm spirit maybe she unhinges her jaw and she swallows all the all the harmful bugs that are in the fields she just drinks in all the locusts and all the um all the all the harmful insects and just swallows them all I, I am I am now pew pew brain. Uh, I, f I I am I am seeing a man whose whose wife has died in childbirth, and he is a farmer, but he has this little child to take care of, and it's continually screaming. So 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 she could come and help him tend to the crops, but only in midday, and he would he would never know because the crops would just be picked up and uh harvested that's the word and he would always just come to a, to a bountiful harvest after he's done tending to the child oh okay so it's like the ghost of his wife living on to help support her family pretty much that's actually pretty cool. i didn't think of that but but that sounds good and then like if that... that could be her backstory yeah that could be a backstory and then maybe even after the it strikes me that that ghost would either then disappear when they no longer needed her, or you could have it or mm -hmm. like when, when the maybe when the the farm becomes successful, she goes away. So that would be kind of an interesting story if the kid was like, "I'm getting older, my farm's doing better and better. If I do well enough, my mom will stop showing up." Right? That could be an interesting moment where your character has to realize my farm has to stop. And there's the conflict. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. I love so, it. So that could be kind of cool. If this is like uh, Mother Spirit maybe will disappear when the farm is successful. Um, or we could have it be that perhaps she will continue to persist and just stay there in like haunting. It's like a good haunting, right? So she's haunting the fields uh -huh. in perpetuity. It could be that even once the the husband and kid grow up or move out or do something else, she stays there and helps any other family that moves to that farm too 
but that, that obviously doesn't and there sound could like be that. a connection to the midday lady by ways that that she uh, the childbirth and the death of the mother happened exactly when the cr clock struck midday and uh, the polednica actually came and gave the dying mother her powers so she can stay longer sure that's cool died at midday yeah maybe the clock kind of she appears right at the time that the clock stopped at like in the conjuring or something like this this is like the opposite of a pretty novel. much yeah i like this we don't see a lot of friendly ghost movies anymore do we um okay and it's also a spin because because she's scary but the child is used to her because it's her or their mom so she's not scared of the ghost yeah exactly that i i think that's kind of cool if the ghost still because we only changed one thing right we only changed her personality we didn't change her appearance yeah so she still looks all messed up but i think that's kind of i uh... actually have a picture somewhere oh great feel free to share i kind of like I when the, when the good characters are ugly and the, you know we sort of avoid this in the like sort of disney version of fairy tale folklore it's like the pretty people are good and the ugly people are bad but i kind of like when the ugly ghost is actually good and helpful this one this one is kind of half pretty half ugly because she has the wreath on her head and i like it oh wow i'll um i'll bring it up in the window here so this one is pretty spooky we've got the missing jaw with a very long tongue extending out of it and then we have the the jaw is hanging around her neck like a necklace. That's a nice touch. And she's got the scythe, and she has one gardening glove, it looks like, and then has murdered somebody here. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, imagine if this if you see this character in the field, and you're just like, oh, that's just mom. No, don't worry about her. She's just helping out. Hey, mom. <laughs> you just... Uh, you look forward there, to seeing there, her. There's a much more disney version right under it here. But I kind of like the, the 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 scary one better. Oh yeah, let me because you know one. with kids when they're small and they get used to something that that should be scary, they're not scared of it because they're kids and they learn that this is a good one, and yeah. I don't care that their jaw is hanging off of their neck like a necklace, like you said. Exactly. It strikes me that maybe she was killed in a farm accident. Does that sort of seem like that would explain why her jaw is kind of half off like that? I mean, I mean, this is the Middle Ages, so we we don't have like a combine or something to run her over. I don't know. I mean, one one wrong swing of the scythe, or maybe it was murder, I guess. But it feels like if she's holding a scythe and her jaws cut off, it just feels like these things are linked somehow. But uh, who knows? Maybe we could do a story <laughs> where we have to figure out who murdered who 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 murdered the ghost. Who she done it? Yeah, she can't tell us. She doesn't have a jaw. She can't talk normally, so we have to investigate. All right, so um, this is a cool new version. We've we've come up with the nice, uh, what's her name? Poledinse. Poledinse. Okay, the nice Poledinse. Do you have a new name for this version? I I mean, it literally means midday midday lady. So I I don't see anything wrong or murderous about that name. So I think she can keep it. Yeah, or maybe we could say the midday mother if it's kind of like the. Midday mother, that's good. That's good. This is why you're the writer. <laughs> yeah. So the mother kind of like takes care of the farm, I guess. She shows up at midday to be, well, we're sort of looking at the medieval definition of a mother, right? Which is someone who takes care of the farm and the family. So she um, shows up for like, I guess, and an also hour. she's kind of a reapress. You oh, know, what? like the Grim Reaper. Oh yeah, a reapress. Yeah. I, is is that I've never heard reapers as a word before, but I guess it does make sense. Yeah, she, I just uh... made it up. <laughs> it makes sense. You know, like a seamstress, it's a reapress. Yeah, I get it. Um, yeah, she's like a she's like a cheerful reaper. She's not so grim. Yeah, she makes reefs. She's fun. All right, this is a cool new version of this character. Thank you so much for volunteering. I love it. Thank you for having me. All right, let's uh, let's do a couple more. Do we have another volunteer, another raised hand? Who wants to flesh out a creature with us and then we will come up with a new version. All right, Vichikita has raised her hand. I've invited her to 
the stage. Can you hear us okay? Can you hear me? Hey, yes, I hear you. Yay. All right, let's choose a creature. I wanted to go with the Pincoya, because I know her story, and I would like like to shift it a bit. Okay. Pincoya, it's like a mermaid? It's like a human, but she is more related to the sea than anything. All right. Some depictions of her has a mermaid tail, some don't. Okay, great. So let's start with just the physical description then of the character. So in in whatever version you want to tell us about, because I think m most of us have, may not have heard of this character. So tell us what is it? What does this character look like? It's like a blonde woman that walks almost naked on the seashores. Okay. Is this kind of a spirit, or is this a um, biological creature? Um, it's a mix of both, because she was born out of a creature called Millalobo. That's like a mix of a mermaid with a sea lion and a human oh okay so like uh she's born from a sea creature i can't, i'm not sure how to spell the word that you just told us or the name of it um but uh so she's she's like a human that was born from a monster it's like the king of the sea like the version of my country of triton and those type of things oh, okay similar to triton Okay, so she's like a, a magical sea, like a sea nymph, I guess we might say. Sea nymph. Kind of like these characters from Greek mythology. Okay, let's keep um, filling out our description. So we have physical. How about habitat? So you said she stays on the seashore. Does she go in the water too, or does she just stay on the beach? She lives in a in the realm of her father in the water, and she comes out to the seashore to bring the fish to the fishermen. Oh, okay, so she's help a helpful uh, character that helps out humans. But there's two ways the, that fishermen know if there's gonna be like good fish is going to be a good fish season or is not going to be a good fish season it depends if she's dancing in the shore or if she's sitting giving them their back if she's sitting giving them their back that means there's not going to be many fish and if she's dancing in the shore it means there's going to be a lot of fish okay Bad fishing season so she's like an omen or she's giving a premonition to the to the fishermen telling them um about the okay so she she's like a um she warns them about how the upcoming harvest season is going to be yes okay do you know does this character have a backstory um that you know about any details you said she's born from the king of the sea and she lives in the sea kingdom anything else that you know about her uh, yes, how she came to be is that she was born out of a human mother and the king of the sea. Okay. The human mother took her to her family with one only condition. She couldn't be seen or if, and if she was seen, she would turn into sea foam. She can't be seen. Okay, so can't be seen by who? By humans? By by the humans in that moment when she was a baby. Oh, okay. She couldn't be seen by humans, or she would turn into sea foam. Does the Little Mermaid um story take some inspiration from this? Do you know? I don't know. I think, the but Little it's has, it's involves... a really old tale from my country. Yeah, there's. I'm sure a old, older kind of 
mermaid story similar stories have a lot of, of elements in common i just i remember someone turning into sea foam in the original hans christian anderson version of the little mermaid i could have that wrong somebody should look that up for me anyway okay so yes yeah, the little so mermaid he... is cursed and and the end then she turns into sea foam and then she turns into like this air spirit and something like that okay. as far as i remember Kind of similar. So let's um, let me just ask the question. So your family with one condition. So you're saying she was raised by a foster family on the land? No, to her mother and father, to her grandmother and her grandfather. Oh, okay. To her. So she was raised by grandparents. She couldn't be raised by them because her grandmother was curious and she looked into the baby, into the cradle. And the baby turned into sea foam. She oh. ran to her daughter to tell her about this. And her daughter sent her back into the ocean to where her father was. And she was returned as a fully grown human the way she looks now. Okay, so she can sort of never live amongst the humans again because she was banished from the land? Kind of. Okay, great. So we have a, a couple things filled out. We have physical appearance. We have a little of her backstory and what she can do. We have her habitat, um, rules and magic. So I think she is able to predict how good the fishing season is going to be. Or maybe she just lives in the water and can tell how many fish there are. So that's how she she's able to warn the fishermen if it's going to be a good season or bad season coming up. Her personality seems helpful, charitable. Um, and maybe it sounds to me if she keeps coming back to the land and interacting with fishermen, it sounds like she misses life on land. It sounds like she's kind of sad. I could have that wrong, but that's just my reading of that. If you keep coming back to the earth and if originally you were cursed, so people couldn't even look at you, but you keep coming back and keep telling, keep helping them, then that me to me tells me that she craves to come back to land in some way or she wishes she could be a human again. Kind of like Little Mermaid again. Anyway, okay, so that's what we've got um, for this character, and maybe that's not maybe that's not your exact version of it. There's many different versions of these folklore creatures, but let's pick something and change it. Let's come up with a new version. So why don't you choose one of these characteristics, physical habitat rules or personality, and make a different choice. Uh, she's off the stage for some reason. Oh, okay, let me reinvite you. Hey, I I'm back. back. Okay, good. Um, I like this like thing that she has that if. That's kind of also part of the stories that the fishermen say here in that part where she's seen. That's like the south of my country. That's if you see her face to face, then she's going to disappear and the fish is going to be like literally so low that there's not going to be even fish for a even bad fish season there's literally going to be like one or two fish and they're going to be literally so small okay so we still can't look at her up close so she's maybe she's kind of reclusive and shy okay so we have a pretty good picture of what this character is like let's choose something and change it so pick one of these traits one of the rules or one part of her personality and make a different choice what do you want to choose I would like to change a bit her backstory. Okay. Not completely, but the part where she turns into sea foam and create like this thing where her father tells her that this people from the out outside of the sea 
are evil and if she's seen she could turn back into seafoam even though that's a lie a bit like the little mermaid but he's got like they killed my daughter once who knows if they can kill her again uh okay so we're so what what is actually different here or what what is being changed we're saying instead of in in you're suggesting a new backstory in which she was not taken to live with the grandparents yes okay so what what happened instead what should we write here that a human mother hid her from the world okay on land or in the sea in a little house by the sea okay close enough for her to see her father okay anything else I would add that she would grow being like reclusive and afraid of the humans and anytime she saw one she would hide okay so she's terrified of humans in this one in that case is she as helpful to them like does she still warn the fishermen about the upcoming season or does she just stay away from humans altogether? In this case, she would stay away. Okay, so we're changing personality now. Doesn't help humans. Hides from humans. And um, lives alone. I mean, after her mother dies, she'd probably live alone, I would think. Um, so in this version... Let's... Oh, go ahead. I imagine she would be like this immortal creature since she's partly a sea spirit mm -hmm. so lives by the in the house by the sea forever yes okay so let's start to think of now that we've made these changes what can we do with that character or what are some different things different stories that might be able to arise from this character now so it seems to me i'll just get you started with a suggestion but you can take it wherever you want if she has the ability to predict how well the fishing season is going to go. She has these powers that would be helpful for people, but all she does is hide from them. Then you could do a story about the search for Pinkoya. Is it the Pinkoya or is that her name? I'm not quite sure. Um, but uh, a story. I'll just That's her name. About. That's her name. Okay. A story about the search for Pinkoya. A group of fishermen desperately need to find her. Okay, there's just a suggestion for you. You don't have to use that. What do you think are some different story ideas that we could get now that you've made this change? I really like that story. And I would add more than that, that it would be like in the present day, like there's a fish problem that they're literally, or in a more like distant future, a bit futuristic that the fish have like started to disappear and leave the shores sure maybe in global warming and pollution and environmental problems are causing the fish to um the population of fish to run out yes fish population to diminish so the fish the people in this village rely on the ocean and are getting desperate, I think, right? Yes. They are fishing village, so they would be, live out of exporting and even feed themselves with the fish they catch. Great. All right. And then in this case, maybe we could say, I guess if thinking about who the protagonist might be, I don't think it would be Pinkoya because in this version, she has to stay a little bit mysterious. Um, and we probably don't want to start the story on her. We'd probably want to start with a human who either uncovers or remembers the legend of Pinkoya. Maybe his grandmother always used to tell the story or something like that. What do you think? Any ideas there as to who our protagonist could be? More that the fishermen have heard of this, but they already, since no one has seen her, they never believed the legend more than being a legend or a story. Okay, so the village and people don't believe the fishermen. One of the, uh, yes, and one of the newer fishermen, 
a young man most likely okay. is like betting his life on finding this particular girl that everyone says can save their livelihood yeah maybe they think she can bring the fish back And you, I like how you said he's betting his life on it. So his reputation, he's going to spend all his money. He's going to try to get as many helpers as he can to make a big uh, group, get a group together to search up the coast, up and down the coast to find her. That's a good idea for a story. I like that. That sort of um, almost feels like a modern day fairy tale. And there's something I like from the setting of where it could be because the place where it comes from is from a small island here in my country, but that island is surrounded by many islands that have not been investigated. So there are way too many islands that she could be hiding. Cool. Okay, that's a good idea for the setting. So we're kind of going from island to island searching for her with the expedition that our main character is leading. Great. All right. Nice ideas here. Any Anything else you want to add to this? I don't know if it would be useful that in those parts there are usually lots of witches. And they are quite possessive of their, like, territories. So he would have trouble with them. That's a cool idea. Yeah, that would definitely factor into the story. So their habitat, there's, we could say this character's habitat is on the islands off the coast of Chile, living amongst many different sort of island witches and sinister characters that our protagonist will have to overcome to find the uh, Pinkoya. Nice. This sounds cool. You should write this. Thanks. <laughs> I'll think about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Or someone should. Thank you for volunteering. Thank you. All right. So these are some cool variations on folklore spirits. We have Polodnice. We have Pinkoya. Shall we do one more. I have some other ideas for exercise too. Some questions like what's the hardest challenge that one of these creatures might face? What can we use to, or what from that can we use to inspire a story about one of these creatures? I also have the idea of doing an anti-creature, which will be a fun exercise next where we will take an existing creature from the list, ideally from this kind of shorter list, and come up with the opposite of that in every way. So that should be fun. I think I saw Paul had a hand raised earlier. Paul, do you want to do one more creature? You enter the Alice laboratory. Hello, Paul. <laughs> uh, hey. Uh, Shall we do oh, some fa foul experiments? Yes, for sure. Um, I was wondering because I had like um, uh, if if we could talk about something uh, like because I'm doing like this like mythical creatures thing within my own story using like already existing like mythology and stuff. Okay. I was wondering if we could do like. Um, one of the creatures that I'm doing in that, which is um, a Mexican folklore thing, uh, La Llorona. Oh, if you La know what that is. La Llorona, yeah. There's a couple movies about her. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did I spell it right? Um, let me see. Two, two L's, right? Yeah. Double L. Yeah, you spelled it right. All right. So another lady spirit. So... Uh, I guess, like, how, how, how are we going to do this? Uh, uh, we'll start with physical description. Oh, yeah. Um, so, this happened, I guess, it, it's a really old, like, myth. So, you know, it'd be one of those, like, traditional, like, Mexican dresses, I guess. Like, I guess, um, I don't really know how to explain it. Uh, uh, I don't know the word for it, but um, I know what it looks like. You well, know? Let's, let's Google Technic it, traditional uh, Mexican dresses. Yeah. Is it going to be one of the ones that you see pictured here? 
Oh, it'd be something close to the one with the the black dress and the white top. If you see, uh... this one, yeah, something like that. Hmm. This seems also, it's like a little here. costume thing. Yeah, is this a costume or is this? An... I just want to find the name of it. Maybe somebody in the chat can let us know. They're not even telling us here. Okay, well, we'll just write that down for now, and somebody will let us know what the appropriate name for that is. Traditional Mexican dress. Is she wearing a wedding dress, or am I thinking of a different character? Um, It depends on the version. There's different versions of it. Um, Spanish people have their own version. Mexican people have one. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of different I, versions I think, of it. and sometimes she, often, it's she often has a veil, even if it's not a wedding dress, right? Right. Okay. Anything else about her appearance, like besides the clothes? Um. Sometimes she'll have like, um, you know, she'll look scarier by having like paler skin or whatever because she's like dead or something. But uh, you yeah. <laughs> know, depends like which one's telling it. Um. Well, it's you right now, so you'll have to just uh, just make the choice, and we'll we'll say this is your your version of of La Llorona, just because there's so many. So, um, okay. Your, do you think? Yeah. Which is she mostly appearing like a perfectly normal looking human, or is she mostly looking like a zombie, or does she do that on purpose somehow? It would be like a like a like a perfectly normal looking human, pretty much. Okay, so perfectly normal looking human. There's nothing that would give away that she's a ghost. Uh, not really. It's just like <laughs> okay. creepy because usually you see her at like night and shit. Right, uh, right. Okay, so we have um, she looks like a lady in a traditional dress, sometimes with a veil. Let's move on to habitat. So where do we find her? Uh, typically you'll find her by uh, like, um, by like uh, lakes and river basins, just bodies of water and such. Okay. Yeah. Let's look and... at um, rules or magic system. So how does she appear and why? Uh, so it's because she, uh, she really like she drowned her kids or whatever, and then she drowned herself after realizing what she did. Um, and it's sort of like she now roams at night looking for, uh for her children and when she finds kids wandering out past like past bedtime or whatever you know um she will take them and if she realizes they're not her kids she'll like drown them too sort of like a cautionary tale about like staying out too late mm -hmm. wanders around looking for children kidnaps children that she finds realizes they aren't hers and drowns them so I guess we could say her personality is what? Uh, apart from just murderous, um, murderous. She's kind of in like this constant state of grief type yeah. thing, I guess. Grieving. Uh, due depressed. to like the circumstances. Mm -hmm. Um. And also, I mean, not just like as far as like grief. I guess uh, regret goes with that too. Like, mm -hmm. uh, regretful. And this is kind of yeah. one of those characters that she, I think, well, it depends on the version, but in the versions you've mostly heard, did she drown her kids on purpose or was she like out of her mind for a moment on, in some kind of psychotic break or something like that? Or why does she drown the children? Um, so there's two main ones that i've heard one of them is like a psychotic break thing so if she like gets cheated on by her husband and as revenge she like drowns her kids but then she realizes what she's done and she drowns herself and then um in another one uh it's sort of like um <laughs> It was sort of like even less of a reason to do that. Her husband was gonna leave her, uh, but uh, she had the kids and she drowned them, and then to punish him, you know, she 
Yeah. Okay. Dang. Uh, a lot of these are very weird. <laughs> yeah, this but, kind uh, of makes her a little more villainous depending on, like, the exact rationale why she did this, right? Whereas if it, in a sort of modern context, we might come up with a version where it's like, she ha has a legitimate mental illness. It's not, like, because her husband's leaving her or whatever, right? Right. Okay, so different backstories, different versions of this. Um, we'll try to stick with just one version, but we can list the other possible variations. Looks like some folks in the chat have told us about the specific name of these dresses, which I just want to paste in the chat, even though I can't pronounce these, I don't think. Uh, there we go. I'm not even going to try because I would sound very foolish. And here's another possible style. Okay, um, so we have physical, we have backstory, habitat, rules and magic system, and personality. Let's change something. What do you want to change? Uh. Mm, I guess mostly like the. <laughs> The personality, <laughs> I I think it's okay. strange for them to like, I don't know, have this like. Th they'll they'll go and murder their kid, and then they'll be like regretful about it, you know? Like yeah, maybe she's thriving. Maybe she's child free, and she's like, I can get more done than I ever got done before. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Dual income, no kids. No, whatever. So sorry, bad suggestion. What do you what do you see this meaning? So she's not murderous. <laughs> What is she doing instead? What is her? What is? How, how do you see her personality instead? Or what? How could we change that up and make it interesting? Um, I still, I, I still like the, uh, the idea. I, I like the idea that she still stays around like these like river basins and these um, uh, these lakes and stuff, and and I think it would be better if she maybe did that to scare people away from the possibility of drowning. Oh, okay. This is good. So in this case, she's she's still grieving and depressed and mournful and regretful, but she channels that differently. She channels that into a desire to save others from the same fate, right? Yeah. And so like, she's, uh, she's going to wander around like... looking for children and be like, she's going to intentionally scare them away from the water so that they are safe? Yeah. <laughs> so it's okay. like as far as like backstory goes I, I would think of maybe changing it to like maybe her children drowned or whatever and she drowned trying to save them oh, um okay. and now to prevent the same fate for others she like you know cries every night to like scare them away but it's also good. still like a situation of uh grief okay i like that so we've changed the backstory much more sympathetic version of the creature in this one um, so she is helping people. So let's now we're gonna have to think of a story though. So we'll need a little conflict, right? So let's try to right. think of what would be a story now that we could only do now that you've made this change. Oof. <laughs> she, could, she could be the main character of this version, right? Right. If you wanted, just because she's very sympathetic, and if we're well, you don't. It doesn't have to be, but it's up to you. What do you think? Uh. Um, La Lona is sympathetic and wants to help save children from drowning it could be a situation where she can't really like physically do anything about it um, you know what I mean where like her only way of like thwarting off people is to like scare them away by um but also it's a situation where like maybe she's at like i'm thinking like border crossing type shit you know people are coming over here for like a chance at life or whatever but it's also super dangerous and she's trying to stop them but she really can't because they're kind of want to protect their children is you know stronger or something i don't know it's it's a little bit of like conflict and maybe they can see her but it's a thing where they don't really their past caring about that kind of thing you know uh, okay that's this uh would seem almost like in this version like the opposite of conflict though right because she's trying to help 
but they I, I like the idea of people trying to cross a river or a border it doesn't just have to be the u.s mexico border i think actually a lot of that is not really like there there are a few river crossings to get into the u.s but not all like there's a bunch of places you can you can cross that don't require a river but in, in any case yeah. it is an interesting idea that in order to cross into a new country to have a better life you will have to get past a ghost that's cool um but then let's ask what's the the conflict goes what's the conflict though the ghost is helpful in your version yeah exactly (laughs) it could be a situation where maybe she realizes like she can't do anything to prevent this so it's like i might as well help them type thing so she has to scare off these like you know agents or whatever that are patrolling and shit oh Um, okay that's kind of good she decides to help immigrants crossing a river and fends off the agents pursuing them or it could be other criminals pursuing them right it could be like if you didn't if you wanted to have the villains be a group of human traffickers or bandits or something like that then she maybe is going to protect and shepherd the immigrants i guess we probably want it to be more than just one single river crossing maybe they need to get down a river wouldn't that be more like a movie or than a like just crossing a river feels unless it's really really wide one feels yeah, like I feel it you. wouldn't take that long in a in a modern day setting unless this this could also be before modern day if this was historical then crossing a river can take days of preparation think like Oregon Trail right yeah so what year would you want to set this in um i would probably do like an older situation like um like old west type shit you know like oh, uh, cool. So, new story. Uh, Old West. La Llorona. There we go. So, in this case, we have a... Uh, do you think it's a family crossing the border? Or like a caravan? Uh, yeah. Okay. And I feel like that was not that difficult in the Old West. So this is this is what's going to make it difficult, right? It's the fact that they have to cross a wide river. This will take days of preparation. We have to, like, cough the wagons, um, prepare, slash, package all the food, powder, and other goods, right? Like, it's, a, it's actually a, a, it was a substantial task to cross a river in this time period. Um, and yeah. then in the process of preparing for that, they notice, they start to see this ghost, right? Starting, trying to warn them off, trying to scare them. Maybe if your main character is a kid, it can really help and stuff like this. Cause they're just like, you didn't see anything stupid junior. Right. Right. And then when they actually, it gets to the point where they realize they're being tracked or there's people looking for them. They need to rely on the ghost to help them. That's cool. Yeah. The ghost, or yeah, so I guess for now I would just suggest main character is a kid, makes contact with the ghost, ghost realizes the situation, and decides to help them instead of scaring them. In this version, I think it would probably make more sense if your ghost could affect things in the real world, though, just because it promises us more fun and games to, in the story, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, it could be, like, attacking whoever the uh, antagonists are. Of the, uh... Right, right. So, um, she is going to, pos- like, use all her... We, we like just rooting for the ghost. That's just fun. So, we're going to use all her ghost powers to take out these bandits and help the people cross the river. That's cool. Sounds That's like how I movie. felt about watching, um, what's it called? Uh poltergeist you rooted for the ghost yeah towards the end when i realized like what the situation was like why they were haunting the place i was (laughs) like oh get them out (laughs) let these people rest yeah that that's funny it's uh it um that's one yeah one of those classic examples of we sort of deserve to be haunted in a certain way yeah all right anything else you want to add to sympathetic la llorona uh no i think this is good (laughs) cool thanks so much for volunteering all right thanks paul 
Um, so, some interesting new story ideas. I hope we're seeing that you can just change one or two things about the character and get whole new stories or suggest whole new versions of these of these uh, creatures. Or we're sort of suggesting new protagonists, new ways that these creature, creatures and characters can interact with the world. I want to do an anti-creature. Let's make an anti-monster. Let's get uh, another volunteer. Michelle. I've invited you to the stage. Having trouble accepting it? Okay, you may have to try a different device or disconnect and reconnect, or if you're using a tablet, turn it on its side. Let me know if that ends up working, if we can help at all. I'll take another volunteer in the meantime if she's not able to get it to work. Anyone else? Nacho, Amanda, Dan? Hey, Nacho. Oh, looks like Dan has raised his hand. Oh, he has? Okay. Hey, Dan. Hello. Let's do an anti-creature. And I've got these, oh, just these three. Oh, I see there's more on here. Let's see. Let's pick from this list. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Anti. No, when you say anti, does that mean the exact opposite of it? Or do you mean more like a foil form? The opposite. So like a werewolf that's a wolf most of the time, and it turns into a dude during the when the sun is high you know what it's well, that, like that actually exists in dungeons and dragons where it's called the wolf wear where they are <laughs> i believe wolves that are actually cursed with a lycanthropy that turns them into humanoids that's funny. i'm not even making this up no i believe you dnds have got all kinds of crazy stuff um so you don't have to pick that one or you can come up with your own version but yeah that's the spirit of what i'm talking about like the opposite the inverse of the creature So I'm going to make this tough. Let's see. Let me pick... Um, I guess... How would I physically make this creature the inverse of itself? Let's try, I guess... A, let's try a genie. Genie, okay. So first... Instead start of living in for a djinn, I guess that would be... They are usually associated with the element of air. So there is that aspect, normally. They usually are sometimes seen that, well, air and mist and other things like that. They are often consumed, cons confined to like some sort of wish magic. To lamp. So they can be bound into an object. Yep often sometimes called Jinn. I know the fire version of these things is called the Nifrit. Mm -hmm. I don't actually know if there's a water or or, or earth-based version of these things. So right off the bat, we make it earth earthy, and suddenly it's an opposite. Okay, well, let's let's list out everything we know about genie or jinns before that, though. So, let's, so we started with it's associated with air or fire. It's often bound or confined. Um, or it, let's just say it's... Uh, can be trapped it can it's bound by rules of wish magic which include things that you can and can't wish for and it has to follow its own rules it can be trapped in an object like a gemstone a crystal or a lamp anything else you want to say about these guys um usually eternal eternal meaning immortal 
Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean eternalist and they don't age, but I'm pretty sure that you can kill one somehow. It, uh, it always gets weird in that sort of stuff. Okay. Anything else? What do they look like? <laughs> they usually have, well, often they kind of look sort of uh, Middle Eastern in their design and their garb. So they often like have, they humans, right? have, I don't know what the kind of hat is, but it kind of looks like a wrap hat. It kind of has that dome shape that you sometimes see in Persian. You know what I'm talking about? And they have the poofy pet and the poofy desert pads that you often associate with the. Uh... They look like humans in traditional Middle Eastern clothes, is what you're saying, is what we often expect yes. them to, to look like. Okay. And they may or may not them. even have legs because the bottom half of them is a wispy bit bound to air lamp. No lower half, wispy air tail kind of thing. They sometimes have legs, though. I think it's more that right. they're, they're sort had, of like... Uh... I said, that's why I did say sometimes they do have legs. Mm -hmm. So they're sort of incorporeal and can change their shape or their appearance, right? Yes, they're sort of incorporeal. They can sometimes teleport around the teleport shape change. Do a bunch of impressions like Robin Williams. Okay, um, so here's a bunch of facts about genies. You don't have to make, do. You don't have to create a creature that's the opposite of it in every single way, because that sometimes just isn't possible or just ends up as a crazy mess. But maybe pick a few of these things and flip them around to the inverse, and so let's see what we come up with. Well, let's take the most obvious and make it fiery or fire or earth, or let's just say it's mud elemental. Okay. To make that. Best. Anti -gen I'll just call it the anti genie for now. Okay, what else? More chaotic in their in their in their uh, perhaps lack of rules in their way their magic works. They may like twist reality to twist reality itself. In fact, they prefer to twist reality simply so they don't have to be bound by rules. They hate being bound, okay? In fact, they are unbound. They just live wherever. They, Or maybe they're constantly traveling, right? That would be the opposite of being yes. stuck in, in one place. They have to keep moving. Nomadic, just like the sands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be kind of cool if they traveled with a sandstorm or something like that, like a migrating... Finding coastal. a new oasis to replenish their water. Mm -hmm. Very cool. They're nomadic slash traveling. Maybe travel with a storm, just an idea. But usually water and earth are not associated with chaos, but they are. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, genies tend to have rules that they must follow, that are bound by law and rules and order. Mm-hmm. Hang on, I lost my place. Where did it go? Okay. So, mud, earth-based, chaos, spirits. Um, what else? Uh, so, before we said they were trapped in an object. Now we say they're constantly moving. Before we said they were bound by rules. Now they're not bound by any rules. They're, bound, they're associated with the opposite elements as before. Let's look at what they do. So, what do genies do normally? Don't they grant wishes when you find the lamp? Grant wishes. This would be like the opposite of that. Would almost be when you find them, they make you grant wishes. They they have requests or of you, you or something serve like them. that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like so, if they too have to be careful what they force you to grant their wish, because just like with the genie, oh boy, if you word yourself improperly. So when you find one, you're just getting yourself a twelve-inch pianist. Okay, so yeah, I, I, that's I, that's an old joke. I remember that one. So when you find one, they have they can make three requests of you, basically. I think, right? Right. They make three requests. They they give you three quests, I guess. All right. What happens what if you, do you what happens if you don't do what they say, or are you just magically compelled to do what they say? It's sort of like a magical compulsion. I don't know if you're common if you're if those. Chaos, G A S. 
which is like a magical force thing you to force magic that forces someone to do a quest or it kills them if they decide to not do what they're told. Yeah. Um. How do you say this? Uh. It's is it Gia? Gesh. Gesh. I think is how you pronounce it. Yes. Really. Gesh. Yeah. Okay. Really. I just looked it up and just clicked the button that click told me how to pronounce it. So yeah, G E A S. All right. Um, I had no idea. Yeah, I didn't either. <laughs> So you're magically compelled to do what they say, so you don't want to run into one, because if you do, then you're going to end up with, like, sort of forced to complete three very difficult tasks, I would imagine. They're probably not easy to do, right? Correct. So, three difficult quests that serve selfish desires of the genie. And uh, what happens when you complete them? Usually when you complete the genies, when the genie completes your three wishes, it gets freed, doesn't it? Sometimes, uh, it depends. You know, the Aladdin, in Aladdin, you had to wish for the genie's freedom. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it just gets bound back to the lamp until a brand new owner comes about. Okay, so what do we want to say happens when you complete the three quests for this anti-genie? Well... If he's the foil of the genie, then he's like, all right, you're free. I can't. And even if I come across you again, I cannot make you give me three more wishes. Yeah, maybe when you complete the three tasks, you become an anti-genie, right? Because if they're the ultimate unconfinable creature, maybe this is how we get more of them. Oh, then that makes you go, jeez, why do I want to complete the tasks? There has to be some sort of way that you can beat this thing and not get a Pyrrhic victory, so to speak. Yeah, that might so be. It a seems good like you either story. die or you become a, or you get transformed into a into an earth earth genie. It doesn't sound too great of a. No. It's then. No, it's not a great situation to be in. But that could, that could be an interesting story, right? Somebody ends up with these quests. They're like, "How do I get out of this? I don't want to be a genie, and I don't want to do these quests. So I need to." Find or it could to... be that you will become the anti genie, and the other person, and the other, no longer is. It becomes a human again, or it goes away. Yes. Which one? Mm, either or. It depends. Were they naturally one, or were they just a, uh, or were they some sort of person, personoid creature? Okay, so I'm just gonna, I'm just, gonna, just to have something to write down. I'm just gonna make a choice and just, just, just to have one possibility. So we'll say when you complete the quests, you become an anti genie, and the anti genie becomes a human. You kind of switch places. Cool. I like this. Do you have a name that you'd want to give these guys besides just Auntie Genie? Uh, let me think for a second, because I feel like there's a name that could fit in well with the earth and water theme, like Ifrit and uh, Jin. You can think about it, and I can come back to you, or you can let us know in the text chat if you want. Apparently, Earth Genie are, call, are exist, and they're called Dao. They exist? They're real? Oh, yeah, I guess so. Well, that's big news. So, yeah, feel free to do some thinking on the name or anything else you might want to add to this one. And uh, fill us in when you're ready. I think we'll move to the next um, activity. We have about 25 minutes left. Maybe I will start. I, I do want to look at this. Um, I have some ideas on where different creatures can come from. This is from a Tumblr post that I really liked. Uh, fantasy setting where humanity's weird thing is that we're the only sapient species that reproduces organically. How can choosing how a creature reproduces be interesting at all or fantastical at all? Um, it actually really can. So we'll get into that in just a moment. All right, uh, so maybe we should stop for questions and comments so far on anything we've talked about today, anything you guys are just curious about or you'd like to hear more about in terms of creatures and designing them, factoring in things like their physicality, personality, habitat, diet, things like this. Any questions about just the basics of creature design? Michelle asks, my fantasy story about the is about a snow dragon. How can I make it magical? Um, well, the first thing that you can do is you're going to have to define a magic system that your dragon is going to be using. So a magic system is just a series of rules. 
a series of rules that governs a supernatural element in a story. And um, often that is going to take the place of, or take the form of a genre of magic. Like divination is a magic system that is concerned with telling the future, for instance. So some creatures have their own magic systems. Vampires have their own rules and things they have to follow. What are vampires magic systems? Sunlight kills them. They can turn into a bat. They sleep during the day. This, this kind of stuff. So you're going to have to define these things for your own dragon. You're going to have to fill out a little card, kind of like that we've been doing here. So you'll have to start with physicality. How long do they live? Age, size. Um, how strong are they? Do they breathe fire or something else? And then you can decide whatever else you want to add to that list of things they can do, just whatever powers you want to give them. Some dragons can turn into humans or otherwise change form. Some dragons can use telepathy or psychic powers. Some can cast force fields, lightning bolts, or anything that a wizard could do. And you're gonna have to just sort of make those choices as to what your dragons are capable of and at what point they are able to do those things. Maybe they have an evolution or a growth cycle and only when they're 100 years old can they fly or something like that. So you're just gonna to have to make those choices, fill out a little, like almost like an encyclopedia entry for your specific type of dragon. And if you have other types of dragons in the world, you're gonna to have to make a separate card for just dragons, you know, in general versus specific subspecies. So that's how you kind of make it magical is you just think of magical things that it can do and you try to follow and stick to those rules as best you can. All right, hope that helps. Looks like we have a question from Vichikita. I have three types of magical creatures for my story and I was wondering if I have to make it sound real or could I keep them ambiguous? So, um, in movies and TV, we don't need to go into as much detail on the specifics of how any of these creatures are working. In a book, you have more room with these characters and more scenes with them, and you just have to think through a little bit more carefully in a book the specific characteristics of these creatures and how they'll interact with each other. How does their, does their biology make sense, and does it make sense that they live in the habitat that they live in? Things like that. Whereas in a movie or show, we can kind of gloss over a lot of that. You don't always have to worry about that as much. But there are some viewers who will still care. So you don't have to make them sound exactly real. You don't have to come up with the um, specifics of how their digestion system works or how what exactly they eat or how long they live or, or any of those things necessarily. But it should still feel... it's uh, It should feel consistent and like it makes sense in your world. So you can leave them a bit ambiguous as long as they don't do things that contradict stuff that they have done before. You have to just uh, try to stick to the rules that you have created within that story. And then as long as they feel like they're sticking to that, then that should be realistic enough for most movies and shows. Good question. Thank you for asking. Any other questions before we do... A little bit about um, where the monsters come from. Where the monsters come from. Let's see. Here's a question from Trollkeeper, perhaps. Um, personally, I always try to plan them out, powers, visuals, personality, as realistically as I can, as if I was seeing the person creature in front of me, meeting it for the first time. Yeah, that can be a nice way to describe creatures or approach, um, you know, uh, spelling out their physicality, their appearance, pretend like you yourself are encountering it for the first time. Okay, if there's no other questions, then let's look for a moment at this Tumblr post, which I believe is original. Unless this is a repost, then it's by David J. Prokopetz. Um, and he's sort of pitching a D&D style fantasy setting where humanity's weird thing is that we're the only species that reproduces organically, meaning sexually. We're the only ones who actually have babies like mammals do on Earth. So we're just going to give some suggestions on how other creatures, where other creatures might sort of come from. And I really just like the creativity that this inspires and the ways that we can start thinking outside the box a little bit besides just um, changing how big the creature is or what color it is or what it can do. We start to think of more 
abstract things like where could they possibly come from do they do we have to follow any of the established rules on how biological organisms work or can we start making our own here's how we start so let's begin with dwarves dwarves carve each other out of rock in theory this can be managed alone uh, but in practice few dwarves have mastered all of the necessary skills most commonly it becomes a collaborative effort by three to eight individuals the new dwarf's body is covered with runes that are in part a recounting of the crafters' respective lineages and in part an elaboration of the rights and duties of a member of dwarven society. Each dwarf is thus a living legal argument establishing their own existence. That's pretty cool. It's one paragraph that sort of just explains where they come from, but it suggests all kinds of things about their society. Um, and in this version, we sort of get the idea that these dwarves are very much... Uh, creatures of rule and tradition and almost like l legally steadfast arguments this might they might have very strict law codes we see that in some versions of dwarves that they are obsessed with um old grudges in warhammer i think that we see that they are sort of obsessed with conflict and they never forget they're kind of um single-mindedly focused on things like revenge and warfare and everything bad that you ever do to them gets written down in the book in this version, we see that they are kind of, uh, there's not really a concept of parents uh, because of this new creation method. And it's almost like um, they're works of um, not, not exactly art, but it's like a combination of art and craft that creates a dwarf. It's not really love. And there is there may not even be the concept of love in the same way in this society, right? Because what purpose would it serve? So just interesting to think of all the implications that come from just the basic change of where do these creatures actually come from, right? Let's look at elves. Elves aren't made, but educated. An elf who wishes to produce offspring selects an ordinary animal and begins teaching it, starting with housebreaking and progressing through years of increasingly sophisticated lessons. By gradual degrees, the animal in question develops reasoning, speech, tool use, and finally the ability to assume humanoid form at will. And I guess at some point you'd say they would stick, they would stay in that humanoid form permanently, or most of the time. Most elves are derived from terrestrial mammals, but there's at least one community that favors octopus and squid as its rootstock. So that's pretty cool too. The elves start as animals that are educated into. We essentially teach them how to become elves, step by step, piece by piece, which is sort of suggesting that these elves have almost a magic inherent in their words, perhaps, or maybe it's just in this world knowledge is literally power. Um, I think that uh, this one feels a little bit more like a parent relationship to me, but it's just one, only one parent is required, right? And you have to spend so long kind of rearing or cr like uh, putting effort into raising this child. It's not just like you make them fully formed like the dwarf, that you'd have totally different sort of parent and kin relationships in the elf world versus in the dwarf world. Because this suggests that elves would be a little bit more family focused, but without that same sense of two parents in a household, right? So in this version, we can see that um, elves might um, have a lot, feel a lot of ownership for the other elves that they create because they are specifically choosing what they teach it and how. And they're sort of um, all going to have a very strong sense of loyalty to their parent because the parent literally educated them into existence, teaching them everything that they know. So I think that we're going to have to share a lot of knowledge with your parents and also have a much tighter bond, but only to your one sort of crafter or creator. Whereas dwarves, I don't think are going to have really that sense of stewardship over the dwarves that they create because they make them fully formed. They're kind of on their own. Um, any other ideas on just dwarves and elves before we look at a few others? Or maybe you guys have ideas of where other creatures could come from that aren't just biological reproduction? Don't see any questions or comments yet, so I'll just move on. Let's do goblins. I would like to hear some questions or comments, though, if you guys have ideas on other ways that we could rethink creatures like this. Let's go to goblins, though. So goblins were created by alchemy as servants for an evil wizard, but immediately stole their own formula and rebelled. New goblins are brewed in br big brass cauldrons full of exotic reagents. Each village keeps a single cauldron in a central location, and emerging goblins are raised by the whole community, with no concept of parentage or lineage. Sometimes they add stuff to the goblin soup just to see what happens. There are a lot of weird goblins. 
I love that description. So simple and just kind of allows your imagination to kind of bloom and think, okay, what happens if we put a, a bunch of um, acid in this perpetual stew? Maybe we get a green acid spitting goblin. Or what if we throw a guitar in? Maybe we get a mariachi goblin when it comes out, right? So we're almost cooking them up like recipes in this version, but we don't know how they're going to turn out. This is a much less focused, uh, it doesn't really have the, the concept of parentage or lineage, but m very community-based just in the idea that everyone kind of creates the creatures. It's not just elite craftsmen that are able to do it. We have some suggestions in the chat. I like these. So Cappuccinico suggests from Dreams. I love that. There's actually a suggestion for Halflings that I saw once that was sort of similar to that. Michelle says splitting in two. Oh, that's good. Yeah, so like a starfish almost. A character can split in half and, and then create two smaller versions of them which maybe would then continue to grow over time, or you could start with every spe every version of the species starts really big. Let's make this giants, for instance. Let's say giants reproduce by splitting up into multiple pieces that then become different giants, right? That's kind of cool. So we start very big, and your lineage is limited by how many times you can split in half until we get to very tiny, tiny, tiny giants, at which point they, at some point, probably just stop existing. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, li I like the idea of giants starting as big as they're ever going to be, and then the older they get, the smaller they get, because to make more of them, and I guess maybe to sort of rejuvenate their age, they have to create more by um, dividing themselves. Vichikita suggests created out of pure magic, like excess of magic creates a child. Yeah, that's a cool way. Maybe wizards in this world kind of reproduce by accident, almost, when their powers grow too um, great then by mishap, sometimes a child is just created out of like spare magic residue on the floor of the laboratory. And maybe they raise it or maybe they don't. Maybe they attempt to stop these children from growing too big and too powerful because they'll become more powerful than the original mages if you leave them in the lab too long. That's kind of fun. Uh, what else? We have one on uh, halflings. Here's the, yeah, this is similar to Cappuccino's suggestion of dreams. Halflings reproduce via tall tales making up fanciful stories about the adventures of fictitious cousins is halfling culture's main amusement. If a given individual's story is passed around and elaborated upon by enough people, a halfling answering to that individual's description just shows up one day. They won't necessarily possess any truly outlandish abilities that have been attributed to them in the stories. Mostly you get the sort of person whom the stories could be plausible exaggerations of. I love that. It's so cool. It sort of balances out how you can tell the, as big tall tales as you want about these imaginary people and the, the sort of best or most popular ones will show up, but in a more toned down kind of down to earth realistic version than the one that was in the original story. So sort of suggesting that we, we're trying to give them the best traits possible in the story. So when they show up, they'll have kind of a happy medium between that and, you know, an average individual. Um, what else we got? Um, we have 10 minutes, 12 minutes left in class. Maybe we'll just open the floor to maybe you guys have suggestions of where other creatures could come from, or maybe you have monsters or creatures in your own story. You just like some ideas and feedback on. Let's open the floor to anyone who'd like to raise a hand or weigh in in the text chat and um, do one of those things. Vichiketa suggests out of seeds like special seeds that appear every now and then. Yeah, a, a, a species that we have to plant and water and that grows out of the ground would be cool. Maybe gnomes could grow out of the ground or orcs. Hello. Do you have a magic creature you want to get feedback on or do you have some ideas that you want to share with us? Um, I have for two projects that I'm doing that are completely opposite. Okay, let's maybe pick your favorite one and you can share whatever you want and maybe we can give you some feedback if you need. Okay, I, I'm helping my brother do this like video game idea and I'm the one in charge of the story. So I'm creating some monsters because he wanted like SCP monsters like creatures and I'm having like trouble thinking if to make them like amalgamations type HP Lovecraft that in the end that wouldn't be so useful since normally HP Lovecraft didn't describe these monsters like physically and here since it's a video game I would need like then 
to create a physical image for the monster or how to create them specifically because I only have like power ideas. Okay. So if you have some if you have some idea already, then we can elaborate on something that you already have, or do you just want to start from scratch and get some suggestions of weird monsters and creatures? What would be helpful for you? Both things, since I have like three monsters already created. One we kind of build it with my brother. That's like a slime that can divide itself as many times as it wants. And it grows and shrinks in size depending on how much fear they absorb. That's cool. Okay. F absorbing fear from people. Meaning, it, like, just out of the air or it has to touch them or eat them to absorb the fear? Out of the air. Okay. In this case. Ambient. Fear. The other one we had was a small like tiny we didn't know if we wanted him to look cute or if we wanted it to look scary but it's going to be like it can teleport this and is it's a slime still, or this, is a, this is a different creature this is a different creature different creature okay so it's maybe cute maybe scary and it can teleport what else that's mainly its power, and it's mischievous. It literally is like an agent of chaos. Okay. Oops. Any name for this one, or appearance, or anything else? We didn't know what appearance to put on him. We really were confused there. We didn't know. We knew it, we wanted it to be small. But we didn't know more about it. Okay, so but teleporting, mischievous, small creature that is either cute or maybe scary. So like a gremlin or a goblin type creature, maybe. Okay. Um. So do you want some <laughs> suggestions on these, or or do you want to have ideas for new creatures, or what would be best most helpful for you? I would love to have ideas on new creatures, and new creatures, I sorry. would. Like to say the last one, it's only for them not to repeat themselves. That it was like a shadow based creature that could only move through shadows and it's weak to light. This is another new one? Shadow. Yes. Okay. Um, so you're looking for suggestions of creatures that are similar to these, I think is what you're saying, or that are like along these lines. Um, and that are. I mean, if we're looking at SCP or Lovecraftian type creatures, these are cosmic or eldritch horror monsters that may come from distant dimensions or outer space or the deep ocean, or they're just very alien to how humans work. Um, so I find that the a good place to start with these is not to start from the perspective of more tentacles, more eyeballs. Usually not the best starting place. I think um, it's helpful if you start with some kind of human fear. So for instance, let's let, if we just start with something like the fear of vermin, right? Then we can eventually, we build up to like, Lovecraft has these things called rat things or rat creatures in his stories, which are just like, it's a rat with a human face on it. And so that is like a nice starting point where we just sort of have like combined two animals to create something very alien. But starting with the from the standpoint of something that people are afraid of. So if we're trying to create SCP creatures especially, these are usually ones that are going to have very abstract rules or they, they kind of feel like they come from, uh, they have some kind of arcane rule set that applies to them. Like an SCP creature would be like, it's a telephone that sits in the center, that like uh, appears every 10 years and when you answer it, you turn into a like a biomechanical uh, ghost or something like that, right? So it's it's like a phone that appears every ten years. That specificity and just the rules associated with it kind of make it feel alien and abstract in a way because uh, it just kind of feels like there's some rule set applying to these creatures that we are not aware of. So I'm gonna start with yeah, let's start with a. 
uh, household objects. I'm going to start with not a phone. Let's go with a radio. So let's say this is, oh wait, actually, did we do that in control? The game, con am I just taking this from the game control? I think I might be, but <laughs> let's, let's maybe not do a radio. Let's start with a, um, a car. Okay, so this creature is going to, let's say it's gonna be a, It does it live inside the car? Is it a biological vehicle of some kind? Is it a creature that other creatures can get inside? and ride around in. Maybe let's go with... Actually, I might not be getting anywhere with the car. Maybe we'll start with a... I kind of like the idea of creatures riding around on other creatures or deploying smaller creatures. Let's go with a flying monster that can send off smaller minions slash children. That would be kind of cool. And, and for a video game, these usually present interesting mechanics, right? So let's go with a bat slash, um, let's combine a bat with something we would never normally see a bat combined with. How about a helicopter? <laughs> That's so crazy. So I'm gonna go with a uh, flying fuzzy mammal that has a rotary wing that rotates around its head like a propeller. Either that or we could just say it has some mechanical parts on it. That could be kind of neat. It deploys its children, smaller bats, in a swarm to drain blood from people and bring it back to the host parent. All right, that's a super weird idea, but I'm just coming up with stuff off the top of my head. Maybe the chat has some more ideas. What do you guys think? Any other suggestions for strange alien SCP type creatures? Looks like we have a raised hand. Does Mani, do you have a suggestion of a creature for this exercise? I've invited her to the stage. She'll have to click accept if she wants to speak out loud. Um, Amanda or Trollkeeper, feel free to weigh in. Um, Amanda says, more about SCP, is that sci-fi-ish? It can be. Um, SCP is sort of a fictional foundation that categorizes and like collects or captures um, supernatural or alien creatures. So it could be magic or it could be sci-fi based. If you saw the movie Cabin in the Woods, the foundation from that movie is sort of similar. Rolling creatures are kind of interesting. Rolling like a wheel or ball. Any ideas there? Keeper says, living creatures made out of elements, like a being made out of fire, water, earth, etc. This is sort of the Pixar movie that just came out, but yeah, elemental uh, creature types. What about, we can do swarms too. Swarms are always good. Kind of have an idea for the swarms, now that you mentioned like household things. Sure, go ahead. Uh, a creature that can turn into normal objects, like literally a chair, a phone. Okay. And then what does it and do? They are, and going? they can, like, depending on how big or how small the object is, there has to be more than one creature or oh, just okay, one so creature alone can make the object. They can combine then into larger objects. Yeah. That's cool. So yeah, maybe they could stack up five of them. And I was mentioning cars earlier. They could turn into a vehicle, right? If you combine a bunch, they could turn into a uh, a big wheel and roll down a hill. They could turn into a statue or they could turn into a... Um, what else could they turn into? We. I wonder how complex of a machine they could turn into. They could turn into like... Uh, they could hide in a house as like a TV or something. Um, or they, if we're just saying they, they could only be simple machines, then maybe this would be best if they were turning into like trees, rocks, boulders to blend in and hide and ambush prey. Or turn into complex machines for wacky antics.
any other ideas what it could turn into or what you could do with a creature like this? I think it would be useful like to confuse the players in the case of the video game because they can go through the same room twice and there's going to be like one chair when they pass and if they're not being careful there's like three chairs suddenly and they are like okay I think there were three chairs or something like that yeah so the objects are rearranging or following them that could be pretty cool um, nice, and Michelle has suggested the name an organic transformer. I guess that's kind of what it is. It's an object in disguise, just like the transformers with the cars. All right, lots of fun ideas here. Um, maybe some really silly ideas too. Flying bat mammal with rotary wings, that's crazy. The organic transformer, also crazy, but that might work a little better for a video game. I think we have to wrap up because we're at the end of our time, but hopefully this has given you a couple ideas, a um, couple fun things to think about. Thank you for volunteering, Bichiquita. Yeah, thank you. It helped a lot. Great. So we are at the end of our Magical Creatures class for today. So we want to just let you know about all the stuff coming up later today at 5 o'clock. We have a class on science fiction, world building, and plots. Um, Friday, June 30th, first session of Feature Boot Camp. Here's the Boot Camp sessions coming up. Um, I will leave this page up with all the upcoming classes and I'll take a few questions. Looks like Michelle has one. Go ahead, Michelle. So I've invited you to the stage. You can either type out your question in text or you can accept and ask out loud. Thank you, Nacho. He's linked the Writer Circle, which is on WordCamp, the same server you're already on for novelists who are looking for a writing group, check that one out. Here's a question from Michelle. How do you write when you're depressed and can't think of anything? Uh, it's a good question. Um, this is uh, not exactly related to the topics for today, but just a good general question. How do you write when you can't think of anything? Well, if you outline properly, you don't need to think of anything, is how I kind of approach this. Um, and if you've outlined in detail, you have a full set of scene cards that tells you what happens in every single part every card tells you what happens in the scene in as much detail as you can, then you sort of just do your best to trudge through it and you write a bad version of it and just do a bad, just be okay with doing a bad job. And if it turns out to be trash, when you look back at it tomorrow, you can always throw it away. But usually you can find some nuggets of usable stuff if you just commit to writing a bad version. And if you've done all your outlining work, then you don't need to worry about what happens next exactly. You still have to worry a little about how does it happen on the page, and sometimes it, you just don't get anything done, and that's okay. But I would say the best way to get over this idea of I'm not feeling in the mood, I can't get any writing done today, is just commit to be like just be okay with doing a bad job, with, with the knowledge that you're not damaging the project permanently. You can always come back tomorrow and throw out the terrible stuff that you did. But I would just look at it as I need to get through the cards that I've written out for myself. Whether it's good or bad is not my concern. Um, I have to write it anyway. And if you're sad enough, if you're really just having a terrible day, then I would say just don't write. <laughs> if, if it's so bad that you like for, have to absolutely force yourself, just uh, just do something else that day. There's like It's not worth... Um, if you can't make yourself do it, then it's not worth your mental health to just force yourself to suffer. So eventually you are allowed to just say it's not happening today. But try to give it your absolute best. Commit to writing a bad version. And once you do the bad version, you can, I don't know, go outside and play kickball. And Trollkeeper suggests watch other TV shows and movies in the same genre of what you're trying to write. It's a good way to research and come up with ideas. There you go. That's a good suge suggestion, too. All right, we're going to wrap up for today. We will maybe see you guys later at the Science Fiction Class at 5, or we'd like to see you for any of these upcoming events over the course of the end of June and July. We hope to see you guys soon at your next Script Camp class or event. Thanks so much for coming by.